Shall we start? Okay, good morning, everyone, and dear colleagues and students on, on the cloud. A very warm welcome to all of you to this uh, policy dialogue series 2021 to 2022, co hosted by the Department of Asian and Policy Studies at HK and the Division of Public Policy of HKUSD. So, they, we have been running this uh, program for three years, which features Professor Anthony Jan, the former uh, uh, Transport and Housing Minister of Hong Kong SAR government. And then uh, if, uh, my name is Alex Jingwei He, I'm the uh, Associate Professor of the Department of Asian and Policy Studies at here at uh, EDUHK. So if my memory serves well, this is the third time in the past two years that we talk about COVID. And then if we, you know, if I recall, when I recall the past three uh, seminars, every time when we do it, it's always closely geared to this COVID situation in Hong Kong and beyond. And two years ago, when we first started this COVID discussion with Professor Jan, that was, you know, March 2020, when everyone in the world was very anxious and struggling about COVID. And then, so Professor Jan, that time, mainly took it as a crisis management topic. And at that time, that was truly a crisis. And but now with Omicron, it's no longer a crisis because we're about to enter the world of so-called new normal. And second time, we, you know, when we talk about uh, this COVID, Professor Jan with uh, Professor uh, Christine Lowe and Donna Lowe, they both discuss about the deep impact COVID. So this is the third time in 2022 when we talk about COVID in Professor Jan's policy dialogue series. And then this time, uh, Professor Jan with, the two, with the two other very distinguished experts will be talking about COVID-19 strategy at the crossroads, uh, looking at both Hong Kong and the worldwide. So joining Professor Jan today uh, are two very distinguished experts. Uh, they are Professor Feng Hong from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And Dr. Feng is the uh, executive director of the CUHK Medical Center. And so he will bring in some valuable public health expertise uh, in this dialogue. And then also joining us today is Professor Wu Xun, and he's a professor of uh, HKUST and very distinguished expert in, in public policy. So three of them will uh, form the team today. So I hope uh, the participants can you know, really benefit and enjoy this discussion. So without further ado, let me first introduce, invite Professor Zhang to start his presentation. Professor Zhang, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, for your introduction. Mm -hmm. Uh, indeed, uh, this is the third time uh, we are talking about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in this uh, policy dialogue series. I remember the first time uh, back in March 2020, when we touched on the topic, uh, most people were anxious about the uh, impact or the potential impact of COVID. But then at, at the beginning, uh, we all assumed that, okay, this is another SARS, maybe more serious than SARS, and SARS was by and large over in half a year. So at that time, uh, people were unable to really anticipate how this pandemic evolved. And now two years later, uh, we are still faced with COVID and its uh, variants, uh, the latest one being Omicron. And uh, we are still uh, not sure whether we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Of course, uh, some nations are preparing their exit strategy uh, and some are preparing to uh, have coexistence with the virus, but still uh, anxieties uh, continue. And then because of the uh, new variants, sometimes uh, restrictions have to be tightened. So in this presentation, uh, first of all, I would try to outline the uh, overall global situation. And then I'll talk about uh, the uh, dilemmas and paradoxes 
and I would uh, make, and then I would focus on Hong Kong and see what the Hong Kong experience uh, can tell us. Okay, this is a second slide. Yeah. Uh, now, if you look at the global situation, and this is according to the uh, our world in data uh, information as at uh, 11th of January, a few days ago, the, the figures are all the time uh, on the upward trend. And uh, this is really a serious pandemic so far, uh, confirmed cases, uh, 313 million, and I'm sure today it will be much more than that. And then number of deaths, 5.5 million. Uh, now the, the diagram shows you where the uh, hatted areas or, or countries, regions are uh, within the world. And East Asia, particularly the mainland of China seems to be doing very well in, in terms of uh, uh, the impact uh, uh, being recorded. Sorry, uh, just hold on. There seems some problem with the computer. <clears throat> okay. Uh, now, uh, the weekly confirmed uh, number of confirmed case, uh, uh, cases uh, per million. Now, this is as at 11th of January. And because of Omicron, you can see that Australia now becomes a, a hardest hit area and also uh, North America, mainly the US and then Europe as well. And um, so the, the, the situation is actually quite worrying in certain parts of the world. Now, um, I'm not trying to be too scientific here, but if we just look at uh, the uh, results in terms of confirmed cases per million population and number of deaths per million population, because this somehow reflects on efforts made or the systems uh, being available in different parts of the world in terms of coping with uh, the pandemic. And if we put Hong Kong against other countries and regions, uh, uh, some of the uh, selected countries and regions. Now, uh, obviously, the mainland of China, China is doing very well. And then Macau is also doing very well. Uh, Hong Kong is slightly behind, but Hong Kong is doing better than many other countries and regions. Uh, at the beginning of the uh, COVID pandemic, Back in early 2020, I remember uh, in my first presentation, I said, well, Hong Kong is, was, doing, was doing as well as Singapore, uh, Japan, and South Korea. East Asia was regarded as uh, a better performing uh, uh, part of the world. But now we can see that Hong Kong has actually done uh, better than Singapore and uh, Japan and Korea. Australia was doing very well at the beginning, but now because of the Omicron uh, challenge, Australia seems to be falling behind. And then of course, uh, US and the UK, France, and some other European countries, they remain to be uh, the hardest hit regions, maybe reflecting on uh, uh, the systems or the is being taken to draw very simplistic conclusions, but just in terms of control of the uh, COVID-19 virus, I think Hong Kong by and large has been doing uh, quite well. So this is something that we need to, we need to bear in mind. Uh, just to give us an idea of the impact of COVID-19. It's not just about health, it's not just about the economy, it's also about politics, politics in various senses. 
But here I try to make a point that in fact, uh, uh, over the past two years, particularly in the first year, 2020, uh, the impact of COVID was seen in terms of making and breaking governments and government leadership. Now, this is uh, a slide about Donald Trump. And the quote at the, at the top of, uh, of the photo, this is, uh, well, I hope this is allowed on, on Facebook, on webinar. Uh, this is a remark uh, made uh, and uh, 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 and uh, uh, COVID, uh, and Trump said, "Well, what does it have to do with me getting reelected?" And then the reply from uh, his assistant at the time uh, during the campaign, "Sir, regardless, this is coming. It's the only thing that could take down your presidency." And indeed, uh, uh, Trump has to stand down. Uh, that, that's uh, uh, one way of looking at it. Uh, the, uh, in contrast, the, Australia, the New Zealand Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, she got elected because of her tough policy towards COVID. And his approach at that time was go hard, go early. So uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand had a few uh, lockdowns, national lockdowns, uh, since uh, the, the outbreak of COVID. But of course, now New Zealand is gradually moving towards tolerance of COVID, uh, a, a form of coexistence. If you look at the uh, policies and strategies taken by various countries across the world, in Asia, in Europe, North America, the Oceania, and so on. Well, we could identify uh, uh, some approaches or a mix of approaches uh, to us COVID. And uh, policies taken by different countries actually have uh, been evolving and sometimes changed in tandem with uh, the uh, challenges being faced, whether in terms of health, uh, politics, national politics, domestic politics, uh, and the economic impact. But facing any uh, pandemic or at the beginning epidemic, we can say that broadly there are uh, two categories of strategies. This, is, this seems to be quite simple. You try to contain it, we try to minimize the risk of transmission from the infected to the non-infected, depending on how serious the virus is. So you use uh, quarantine, you use contact tracing, make sure that you know uh, how the virus is being transmitted and try to, to control it. The other uh, category of strategies would be mitigation. You try to slow the spread of the virus and reduce the peak in medical demand. Now these two, uh, 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 slowing down the spread of the virus and reducing the peak uh, in demand are related and yet they refer to different things. Because uh, in any system, the medical capacity, the, the, the search capacity is ultimately limited. So therefore you do not want to overwhelm your system to the extent that other uh, uh, diseases, other health problems are not uh, duly taken care of. So, and then spreading uh, control, slowing down the spread of the virus is important because that uh, affects uh, transmission and that also uh, have an impact on uh, the number of cases that go into the, the medical system. So you try to have all kinds of restrictions on social distancing, uh, schools and business operations uh, uh, and travel restrictions. Ultimately, I think I've we have seen in uh, all governments, whether national governments or city governments, they face a, a, a trade-off, a trade-off between shutting down or locking down to keep people alive or and 
staying open so that life goes on. So keeping life, keeping uh, life and making sure that well, living uh, uh, life back to normal could be restored as quickly as possible. So it's a dilemma between shutting down and staying open. Uh, many countries or cities have resorted to lockdowns of various extent and blanket lockdowns are costly and unsustainable. Gradually, uh, eventually you have fatigue, you have resentment, and then in some uh, cities you have demonstrations and violence as well. The policy debates worldwide from early on have centered around several issues. The, the strategy, the strategic approach between suppression, hard suppression, and some tolerance so as to allow uh, herd immunity uh, to be uh, developed. Uh, the need to face, uh, to wear face masks and to keep social distancing now is regarded as something taken for granted, but in the beginning, it was a great issue. In some cities, people just refused to wear face masks. And those wearing face masks were laughed at at the beginning. Closing of borders, again, now we take it as almost uh, common, whether uh, particularly international uh, traffic. But then at the beginning, it was a great debate in Hong Kong. Remember, we have the great debate about whether we should have total closure of our borders, whether we should have lockdown or not. At the beginning, lockdown was, because lockdown was a very uh, severe measure. So people were very, were very skeptical at the beginning. And when Wuhan and a few other cities on the mainland of China were locked down, people uh, became so, surprised. But eventually, on, in Europe, Italy was the first to have imposed lock, lockdowns, and by now, lockdowns became, have become rather common whenever there was a serious uh, uh, upsurge in COVID and its variants. And then the other measures regarding testing, quarantine, contact tracing, how stringent these measures should be, again, uh, uh, have been very controversial. Whether testing should be compulsory, whether uh, citizens should have uh, to, should use mobile app that enable uh, health uh, and other authorities to, so to impose surveillance to track them down uh, when infection is, a, is a dis discovered. And now vaccination, whether vaccination should be made mandatory. In the US, uh, the pres uh, President Biden tried to impose uh, vaccination mandates, but he was challenged in the court and the court imposed uh, more restrictions on uh, such mandates. While we haven't seen the, end, the light at the end of the tunnel, some countries already are rolling out their exit plans, particularly uh, last year, late last year, when things seem to be uh, becoming better. So uh, we could identify a, a, a contrast between the zero tolerance approach and the coexistence approach. And now with Omicron, we are still wondering whether that would uh, become a game changer in the overall uh, strategic scene. Of course, it all depends on how serious Omicron uh, proves to be. So that roughly is the situation worldwide. And uh, we can, over the past two years, we have also witnessed the multiple ramifications and challenges from COVID. Here, I tried to summarize a few important aspects. In terms of public service, uh, here the quote is from Accenture in, I think it's mid 2020, when COVID was uh, just started, so to speak. Uh, and the quote is, many of the capabilities established out of necessity during this extraordinary time, such as remote work, customer self-service, social media engagement, remote health monitoring will become the new normal of public service delivery. Now that was said back in 2020, and now it has proved to be the uh, sort of uh, reality we have to live with. Economic black swan, the economic impact of COVID was more severe 
than people uh, uh, expected at, very, at the very beginning. Now in 2020, world economic output promoted by 4.2%. And then uh, uh, for advanced economies, 4.6, for emerging markets and developing economies, 2.1. And probably among the major economies, mainland China was uh, the only one recording a positive growth rate uh, of 2.3. Hong Kong also had negative growth uh, during for the whole of 2020. I think it's around uh, 7%. And for 2022, as we speak now, the World Bank is forecasting, forecasting that global growth will slow to 4.1% against earlier more positive forecast and 3.2% in 2023, partly because of the difficulty for governments to sustain uh, their support measures due to uh, the already rather high level of public debt and then uh, uh, impact on the global supply chain of, uh, of uh, COVID. In terms of the role of government and public budget, most governments have resorted to massive intervention in order to keep jobs, to support industries and firms. And government debt has reached unprecedented levels, which are not really sustainable in the long run. For most countries, uh, the... Uh, 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 some even more. Uh, of their GDP. In the case of Hong Kong, uh, we don't have debt per se, but the spending, particularly devoted to the, the fighting the, this uh, epidemic, uh, represents more than 10% of our GDP. Uh, a serious pandemic like COVID uh, presents a real challenge to crisis management and leadership. And different countries, because of the different ways of dealing with the crisis because of their cap government capacity, uh, their leadership style, uh, may well turn out to perform differently. So COVID has become the ultimate stress test for different, for various communities, countries in the world. And uh, from the very beginning, uh, many experts and observers, they uh, realized that it's not just a simple uh, process of handling public health. Uh, that's why uh, Francis Fukuyama, I think in, in April or May 2020, he said in one of his essays, countries with all three, a competent state apparatus, a government that citizens listen and uh, trust and listen to, and effective leaders have performed impressively limiting the damage they have suffered. Meaning that those systems, those countries that do not have these three factors, that do not have um, competent uh, state apparatus or the uh, trust in government is low or they don't have effective leaders, then those countries seem to be uh, harder hit. So it's not a matter of regime type, it's more a matter of how uh, governments uh, in different kinds of political systems work in, the, in reality. And even for uh, uh, high trust countries, they still need to have a proper crisis response strategy and institutional capacity in order to perform uh, well. Some general observations worldwide. No universally agreed way of appraising performance. As we said uh, earlier, China seemed to be doing better than others. East Asia and the Oceania are relatively better than other parts of the world. And different countries and regions define the pandemic crisis differently, therefore resulting in diversified policy responses on all fronts and their exit strategy. The WHO, World Health Organization, uh, seems to have uh, been largely handicapped in playing a more effective coordinating role because of global uh, geopolitics. And as I said earlier, crisis awareness and response strategy both count. The strategy taken to, uh, 
uh, as a response to the crisis uh, are important. And those Asian countries and regions uh, were hit by SARS uh, and some years ago. They mm. seem to be responding better because they are more risk uh, aware. And countries in Europe tend to take a stop and go approach whenever there, there was an upsurge and then they may have lockdowns pending uh, mass vaccination and eventually herd immunity. A few Asian Pacific countries and regions have adopted very stringent suppression strategy, but then some of them are now moving towards coexistence, whether by uh, default or by design. And Singapore or, and New Zealand are good examples. So eventually, crisis governance and policy politics across countries and regions will surround the strategic, the strategic choice between coexistence and zero tolerance. In the case of Hong Kong, now I, I'm sure those of us who are in Hong Kong, we know very well how we have got, what we have gone through. Here, I just highlight some key uh, points. Uh, we have learned from the past experience, SARS in 2003 and the swine flu in 2009. We have reacted uh, quite early on, uh, very speedily. Uh, our readiness and search capacity according to the post-SARS uh, SOP, uh, standard, standard operating uh, procedures, uh, seem to be working well. There, was, uh, there has been interdepartmental coordination, good expert advice for world-class uh, medical and uh, other experts. Uh, we have displayed a high degree of professionalism and vigilance among our relevant personnel, particularly those at the forefront. Uh, we have imposed stringent containment and suppression measures, but of course there are still loopholes uh, discovered from time to time. In terms of uh, funding devoted to fighting the epidemic, our anti-epidemic uh, fund uh, already represents around 11% of our GDP. And then if uh, the challenge of Omicron is more serious, then maybe government would uh, uh, put in more money uh, uh, into the fund. There, there has been good coordinator by and large of various sectors, uh, good community risk awareness, uh, though with some panic and anxiety from time to time. Uh, epidemic information and health advice uh, to the community, to the public, I think uh, is sufficient. But of course, uh, whether uh, such information advice uh, are user friendly enough, that could be debated. In terms of comparative performance, as we have seen from the earlier table that I show you, um, we are doing better than Singapore, Japan, South Korea, and Australia. Uh, death cases in Hong Kong uh, are lower in number than Taiwan, which did very well at the beginning, but now they, they face a, 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 a more serious challenge. In terms of recovery and resilience, we are not the best. But then according to some indices, for example, the Nikkei COVID recovery index uh, just this month, Hong Kong ranks 11th uh, within the world. And then uh, for the Bloomberg COVID resilience ranking uh, in December last year, we are 24. So overall speaking, I think uh, we have been getting it uh, right. But of course, there are uh, problems, there are challenges ahead of us. Now, this is the, uh, the graph uh, recording uh, the uh, epidemic trajectory since uh, the very beginning in Jan 2020. So we can see that we have gone through uh, four waves of uh, the pandemic. Uh, this is the second one. This is the third one. This is the fourth wave. Now, whether or not we will be having the fifth wave has yet to be seen. Uh, so this is uh, a, a, a rather delicate uh, uh, juncture. Now I have to rush because of uh, time. Uh, response and strategy in Hong Kong. Uh, back in May 2020, uh, Chief Executive Carrie Lam said, we are facing a three-way tug war. 
the need to carefully consider the three factors of public health, economic impact, and social acceptance in devising the appropriate measures. Indeed, uh, such a three-way tug of war is similarly faced in other jurisdictions. We have always to uh, track a balance among competing expectations and considerations. <laughs> since, 2020, uh, since the end of 2020, the government strategy has moved uh, towards a more uh, stringent, coercive uh, uh, way. And the official way of uh, presenting it is preventing the importation of cases and the spreading of virus in the community. So more stringent measures have been introduced <laughs> such as the restricted area. In other words, once a locality or a, 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 a building block uh, is identified to have uh, just a small number of cases, the whole block population working there or staying there have to be uh, tested. And then uh, more vaccination mandates uh, imposed in certain uh, locations or circumstances. called uh, vaccination bubbles. Overall, the government has been efficient, although there are criticisms, but crisis leadership seems to have been hampered by the low level of public trust. Uh, support and relief measures have been timely, uh, thanks to our abundant fiscal reserves. But of course, whether these measures could be targeted, could be debated, and whether the current uh, looming uh, sort of fifth wave, Omicron, would induce further demands for relief uh, as yet to be seen. Now, as I said earlier, there has been a lot of information provided by the government. There's a dedicated uh, website and with different languages, including uh, languages of the ethnic minorities. However, information is not the same as communication. And it's not the same as narrative. Narrative meaning that you're able to tell a story. You tell people a story of what we are facing, the challenges, the game plan, uh, strategies, priorities, so that people know uh, how to cope with the challenge. And uh, in any crisis, the public needs clearer messaging on what to do. So not just information, particularly if you over them with a lot of figures, statistics, that doesn't help ordinary public. Every morning, an ordinary citizen will ask, what should I do today in order to minimize risk? Exit strategy so far in Hong Kong is not entirely clear, although the importance of reopening our boundary with the mainland seems to be a government priority. But other than that, what is the overall strategy? How much longer can people wait for returning to normal? These critical questions have not been uh, effectively addressed. And major dilemmas uh, gone through in Hong Kong, uh, there are quite a number of them, to keep the border closed or conditionally open, make the use of mobile tracking app mandatory or to rely on voluntary compliance, to make testing and vaccination mandatory or voluntary with some persuasion and some sector-specific mandates, to insist on a zero case outcome of course, that depends on how you interpret uh, this uh, uh, approach, or to be contented with a vigilant clampdown uh, uh, community spread. And then the views of medical experts sometimes uh, could vary as well. Whether to prepare for and adopt an exit strategy as other jurisdictions like Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. So far, uh, we have not got that kind of uh, clearly spelled out exit strategy. Until we open, travel links with the mainland versus links with the rest of the world because the rest of the world seem to be taking uh, a slightly different approach. Now, how to work towards a more conclusive, conducive strategy for economic recovery while suppressing epidemic locally? I think this is a dilemma faced by all governments in the world. And then the uh, impact of Omicron, whether that could really lead to a possible fifth wave so far, it's not entirely certain, but certainly people are becoming more uh, anxious, sometimes frustrated, and then you have fatigue uh, in any prolonged pandemic. So what does the Hong Kong story tell us? 
in the first in the early phase of the pandemic, government predominantly relied on less coercive instruments, hoping not to interrupt normal social socioeconomic activities to drastically. However, by early last year, uh, as the fourth wave persisted, the government made up its mind to resort to limited localized lockdowns, known as restricted areas, and mandatory testing. In early 2022, right now, restrictions again uh, are tightened due to Omicron. The epidemic battle takes place during a politically turbulent period of Hong Kong, because what happened over the last two years. Society at large is highly suspicious and distrustful to its government policies and actions, and this sometimes affects the effectiveness of such actions and measures. The outbreak of the fifth wave may aggravate the political situation as our new form, Lechko, begins functioning. And then as we are preparing for the coming uh, chief executive election in March. So this time is for a delegate for Hong Kong. As societal awareness and response are of paramount importance in controlling a pandemic, the government factor does not need to be denigrated, even in times of low political trust, because there are suggestions that, in fact, Hong Kong has done relatively well, despite uh, poor government performance. I would not uh, subscribe uh, to that view. I think the government uh, machinery has been working relatively effectively. Of course, there are uh, loopholes, there are problems that should be debated. But then if government was not that effective, I think uh, we would not have uh, our current state of uh, performance. Uh, and, uh, but so the Hong Kong story may suggest that it, the, the, the city suffers from low trust, but government effectiveness is still relatively high, defying conventional assumptions. So the, uh, as a, the present situation, we can say that despite our politically uh, uns, uh, uh, the, the, the lack of political trust, despite uh, 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 the government being uh, uh, subject to uh, all kinds of challenges, we, we have uh, been doing relatively well. But then we could have done even better, in my view, because we have all the other favorable factors, such as uh, a highly dedica dedicated and professional uh, medical service and hefty fiscal resources. So this is the story in Hong Kong so far. I'm sure um, next time when we review the pandemic situation, we will see uh, other lessons emerging as well. Thank you very much. All right, okay. Thank you very much, Professor Chan, for all the great insights. And uh, we'll save the Q&A to the end. So next, may I invite Professor Feng Hong, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the CHK Medical Center. And uh, Professor Hong is, uh, Feng is also a uh, you know, great medical expert. So he will bring in lots of much needed medical sciences knowledge. Professor Feng, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar. And the, the topic is challenging. I'll look at the topic from three perspectives. One is uh, long, uh, not just uh, uh, looking at it as a pandemic, but as a syndemic. The second is uh, more updated in relating to Omicron and risks and how we are managing that. And uh, some of the discussion may uh, resonate uh, what have been presented and discussed by Professor Chang. And also towards the future, you know, where are we heading? Uh, uh, Professor Chan mentioned that there's no end game. As you can see, it, it was difficult to actually come up with an end game uh, before uh, the last quarter, before December. We didn't know Omicron would pop up, and uh, we would not know uh, whether there will be another variant uh, coming up like, uh, in the second quarter or the uh, months ahead. So, but we'll discuss a little bit about, uh, especially from a health system perspective, you know, what will be the future. So first of all, the syndemic. Uh, we call it a syndemic, and it's not just a pandemic. Uh, actually, this article on the right first was published uh, by, it's actually the editorial written by Richard Fortin, the chief editor of Lancet uh, in September uh, 2020. <coughs> so that's a, a pretty early stage of 
and then and then maybe looking at the whole scale of things, we look at uh, who suffered most uh, from the pandemic at that time. You know, in the first half year of the pandemic, it was really the poor, the elderly, the chronically ill, the ethnic minorities and migrant workers, you know, all these so-called disadvantaged, disadvantageous populations within a larger population. Yeah. And it lead to a problem. Yeah? And uh, that's why sort of Richard Horton called it a syndemic. That means uh, it's not only a pandemic of the infectious disease of the virus of COVID-19, but also it's actually a pandemic of problems in relation to all this ill health ar uh, arising from the poor, the elderly, and chronic disease, right? Ethnic minorities, migrant workers. These are the people who suffer most from their conditions. Now, uh, in the world, we have a what we call a universal health coverage alliance. We try to promote universal health coverage uh, uh, for the whole populate for populations in so of all countries, leaving no nobody behind. Uh, tar target is to achieve that by two o three o. So uh, it actually provides a, a very good uh, picture, you know, a pictorial rep representation of what actually. Uh, the health total health impact of uh, COVID-19. The green line is actually the uh, uh, epidemic curve of uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19, and you see subsequent waves. You know the dotted lines represent subsequent waves. So from public health history, we know that a and a pandemic or major sort of a pandemic will not actually die just after the one wave. There will be several waves ahead. Yeah, and that will actually create cumulative impact on uh, the health system and also health of the population. The yellow line represents the sequen consequential effect you know, of actually while everybody is focusing on the uh, virus and uh, we have to delay a lot of uh, the uh, care and treatment for other conditions. And uh, so yellow line represents the kind of the fall behind or the uh, lag behind of uh, the uh, treatment of other health conditions. And all these curves add up together to become the blue line. So at the end of the day, the health burden you know, to the community is actually much larger than the uh, virus itself. I think we have to bear in mind that. And it poses severe challenges to health systems, including uh, the overall public health uh, capacity, uh, how we're going to protect the essential health services, uh, protect the uh, vulnerable groups uh, and ensure financial bar overcoming financial barriers to access to healthcare, and the uh, uh, and there are a lot of decisions that go beyond the health sector. I think one of the key decision points that we have to consider, especially at, like in the context of Hong Kong's health system, where the public healthcare uh, uh, services under the hospital authority is very heavily a burden and uh, huge demand, uh, bad occupancy, even without COVID, uh, before the COVID is already in the order of 120%, something like that. So it's not, uh, so we, we are in a very delicate situation, which, uh, you know, anything, you know, excess and whatever, and, you know, we will not be able to take care of the people, especially not just the COVID patients, but also you know, the other patients you know, uh, as well. And that's an important point we have to consider uh, when at the point of the de uh, decision making, you know, uh, how much capacity we have uh, in total in terms of the virus. Huh? And so far, this is actually the latest report uh, from WHO. Uh, uh, and although uh, they monitor the uh, uh, level of uh, health financial protection across uh, different countries, uh, this report that just came out uh, early this month, uh, it's actually a review of the outcome of impact of COVID on the various health system. And it does show that all the indicators show that the financial protection uh, effect will be adversely affect, impacted by shifting health and economic dynamics uh, resulting from COVID-19. That applies to all countries. And, uh, and this 
dynamics are signals that there are severe inequities across countries and across households within countries. And, and this uh, so-called inequities or diversities will only sort of widen. And, uh, and of course, everybody recognizes <coughs> there's deep in interaction between health, economy, and overall well-being. And all these sort of uh, complex <coughs> interaction or complex actually laid bare by COVID-19. So that's the conclusion uh, of the, on the outcome of what we see to be the outcome of COVID-19 at the present moment so far, okay? <coughs> So this is the first part in relation to the pandemic, the result of the pandemic. Secondly, I'll talk a little bit uh, very briefly about Omicron and risk, because there seem to be sort of uh, diverging, uh, very diversified uh, sort of uh, information or evidence produced by the COVID uh, by, uh, very, from various jurisdictions or countries. Now, first of all, the United States, uh, the CDC, Despite like US at one time, it was uh, a sort of uh, having over 1 million uh, confirmed cases a day. And, uh, uh, and uh, in the past few days, it's been dropped to around 800,000 uh, odd uh, cases of being confirmed every day. 800,000 cases, confirmed cases, still a lot of cases, right? Yeah, and that's why US has been leading the lead table in terms of the number of confirmed cases, is also in terms of the mortality cases. So from that perspective, you know, uh, the American health system, the American government actually has been performing very poorly uh, <coughs> in the context of the whole uh, COVID-19. But despite that, CDC uh, actually recommended the loosening of the sort of uh, quarantine and also isolation criteria, for example, the period of uh, requiring uh, uh, people without taking vaccine, you know, the period of quarantine has been reduced to uh, five days at home. Now that's of course based on some uh, sort of uh, initial evidence that uh, Omicron, that variants, uh, virus, they have a shorter sort of uh, incubation period. And also the viral level dropped very quickly within the first few days. Uh, so unlike the Delta variants or the previous uh, versions, uh, of uh, the uh, COVID uh, uh, of the virus. Now, but is that the evidence? It says evidence support uh, enough to support a change in policy uh, or actually loosening of the uh, sort of uh, containment measure or whatever measure. That's actually something uh, uh, we have to look in uh, carefully. Now, this is a case of Singapore. It, it kind of provides a natural sort of experiment to tell us uh, the effect of. Uh, uh, kind of uh, losing control, opening border, or whatever, yeah. And uh, uh, and the, the graphs show the percentage of uh, people who die from uh, the condition of being critically ill or require <laughs> oxygen in general water and all that. And you could see the evidence seems to show, show that for those who've taken the uh, vaccine, uh, which is actually represented by the blue line, they do much better. You know, they they uh, really you know, and then. The brown sort of lines are really are those who actually have not taken the vaccine. You see, so that means there's a big difference in terms of outcome between those who take the have taken the vaccine and those who have not. Yeah, <clears throat> and that is usually being sort of a, uh, uh, come up with the argument, you know, uh, for the uh, in support of the policy that uh, for those who have taken the uh, the vaccine, so long you have a high vaccination rate, uh, then you can treat the uh, Omicron or the virus very, in a very similar rate as uh, weight as the uh, normal seasonal influenza. Now, indeed, that has the theoretical basis, you know, for a lot of countries, including like UK and Europe. You see. Yeah, but in Europe, the WHO uh, director has just uh, 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 warned uh, that uh, by in two months' time, half of the European population will be affected by Omicron. Now, how about the burden, you know, on the health system? This is actually uh, from UK. They adopt policy. Everybody, you know, uh, just stay at home and uh, and then rest for a few days, and then that's it. Yeah. And uh, but in fact, it has actually, you know, despite the virus is being portrayed as a mild virus, relatively mild, it does increase a uh, poses severe heavy burden. On NHS, you know this, so you can see the right hand side of the graph. This is the latest graph, 
I just extracted it uh, last night. And, uh, and the average uh, uh, people being hospitalized, actually in the, the seven day average is shown here, it's still a significant number, you know, and, I, and I, you can see that why public health officials uh, and all government officials in Hong Kong are uh, very worried because, and they don't actually take a light heart or light you know, approach uh, towards Omicron because uh, in recognizing that in Hong Kong, our public hospital system, our public system probably cannot bear you know, this uh, workload at all. Mm. And, and of course, this is also complicated by the fact that uh, uh, our vaccination rate has not been satisfactory. You know? And uh, so far, you know, uh, this is the, again, the, the figure uh, two days ago, uh, total population, mm. uh, you know, first vaccine, uh, vaccination, first dose vaccine, only 75%. Uh, uh, and given the current status of the virus, uh, uh, as pointed out by Professor K.Y. Yun, <coughs> someone said, uh, if we're talking about, you know, uh, adequate protection of population, or herd immunity, which uh, very few people talk about that today. Yeah, you need with the new virus, even for the Delta version, it needs to be 90%. Uh, if it's mm -hmm. Omicron, it's probably even more, yeah? So very low vaccination rate, largely due to the elderly population, the vulnerable population that I mentioned earlier on. And uh, now in some jurisdictions, in some countries, it seems that uh, uh, they might, might treat it as natural selection. They all die and they die, right? And uh, so uh, there's actually very little discussion, you know, uh, uh, even in the public health literature in relation to, you know, why, you know, uh, uh, the sort of, uh, uh, have, uh, why the, we should tolerate a higher mortality you know, among the elderly or lesser protection for the elderly. Yeah, but on the other hand, you know, uh, 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 I think what actually has sort of let us down in terms of the uh, uh, the vaccination is really the vaccination rate among the elderly population. And this is the very important uh, for uh, the public health officials and for government officials as well, because uh, if we actually sort of loosen up and then adopt a more open policy, and uh, the people who suffer most will be our parents and our grandparents. And it's something that we cannot actually, uh, 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 the <coughs> government's assessment is that, uh, I mean, we can, statistics is all right, but uh, when things uh, happen, when you can see uh, your, your parent or grandparents are passing away because of that, that will actually uh, arouse a public uh, dissatisfaction and concern as well. So big problem, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is how we see the Omicron risk at the present moment. And that's why uh, in terms of government policy at the present moment, we still, I can see that uh, uh, I have sort of uh, almost everyday dialogue with uh, the so-called experts, uh, the expert advisors in Hong Kong government who are all coming from public health stream, uh, not medical group, but public health stream. And uh, this is actually the biggest worry, right? So towards the future, there are a few things which is important. Going back to the HC, uh, health, uh, United, uh, universal health coverage, the alliance, and I think this is actually what they uh, uh, advocate, you know, and what's the advocate is to promote health of all. We must achieve universal health coverage and access to quality health care uh, on the premise that no one will be left behind, no one whether it is the elderly, the poor, the uh, sort of uh, uh, the uh, ethnic minorities or uh, any disadvantageous positions in the community. And they ask six key questions. Yeah, And uh, you could actually go into the detail and then to look at some of the questions. Uh, it's difficult to see uh, the image here. So I extract the questions here. Yeah, first of all, is of course, the political dimension that Professor Andrew Chan also talked about. Uh, and uh, in a way, in Hong Kong, we have a particular situation. Although uh, uh, Anthony mentioned that there's very little trust of people on the government, but there's a high level of trust of people on public health uh, 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 experts, especially uh, some pronounced figures like uh, or like uh, Professor K. Y. Yun, uh, which is of course also very famous internationally. Uh, leading sort of a scientist uh, in the area of viral research and uh, 
Professor David Hoi, you know, and uh, people trust them. And, uh, and it's also a, a kind of uh, fortunate that uh, our political leadership actually follow very closely the advice of our public health experts. You know? And uh, although they, I've heard uh, uh, like business people complaining that uh, uh, our public health experts are very kind of dogmatic uh, from a public health perspective, but at the end, you know, it's actually, uh, uh, they're trying to best to protect the people. So, uh, but of course we understand it has to be done beyond health, leaving no one behind, and that's very important. Regulate and legislation in terms of actually balancing like uh, individual freedom as a gain to more stringent sort of uh, uh, measures like lockdown and upholding the quality of care. And you have to invest more and then everybody moving together. So these are the questions. And of course we can ask ourselves, you know, how well we are doing in relation to these questions, okay? It one by one, yeah? Now, this is a recent article from uh, my colleague at the School of Public Health, uh, Professor S.S. Lee. He used to be an expert in AIDS. Yeah? And he wrote an article and also you know, talking about analyzing uh, the so-called the legal and also uh, rational and, also, and sort of uh, a compassionate basis in terms of uh, some of the decision making. And of course, the argument is uh, whether the discussion point, the point of discussion is whether the current uh, policies in relation to lock, uh, kind of quarantine, uh, the duration of quarantine and, and uh, compulsory testing or, uh, uh, in the localized area, whether they were too stringent or not. And, uh, and there are different viewpoints on that particular aspect. But I think one important point, that, and that is that we learn uh, in health system uh, when we try to improve quality is that even in terms of public health, in terms of viral uh, pandemic uh, defense, it's like a Swiss cheese model is still applied. I remember uh, even in the early 2020, when I was invited to another international forum, I already talked about that. It's very much like a Swiss cheese. That means from a system perspective, you don't just rely on one measure. Uh, so the discussion point should not be just focusing on one single point, whether we close the border or not, whether we uh, kind of, uh, uh, whether we uh, do mandatory testing or not, or what or not, you know, because every measure that we introduce will have the polls, yeah? And these loopholes uh, would have to hedge one over the other in order to prevent the things to fall through. You know, otherwise you will have to get into the problem. So we are talking about, you know, all the policy together, uh, from personal responsibilities to share responsibility, <laughs> everything coming together, and then before you know, we can actually stop the pandemic. You know, otherwise, otherwise there will be a chance that the holes will overlap, and then you can see the red arrow, the virus will go through all these things. Yeah, and I think it's important then from a policy perspective, we don't discuss it on a single policy. It is a whole range of policies that are important and complement each other. They work. Uh, uh, all together, you know, it's, it's not a single piece, okay? This is actually uh, what we, I see to be the uh, system uh, changes that's likely to uh, happen. And uh, from a, uh, uh, that we can see there are a lot of drivers uh, throughout in the past two years uh, when we fight the pandemic uh, that to lead to uh, make requiring challenging the health system, uh, leading to change from, for example, a sickness focus, illness focus with health and well-being, uh, uh, that promised to rethink about like uh, how and where public health should take place, especially in relation to um, primary care. And then the second thing is the agility of the system in moving from peacetime to wartime, you know, uh, like uh, including, mm -hmm. especially in situations in Hong Kong, in which uh, like our public, uh, healthcare system is already under heavy strain even before we uh, fight any war. Yeah. So where are we going to create the flexibility and agility? And uh, how are we going to, in particular, make best use of our sort of a digital system that we go uh, and then which will go beyond hospitals uh, and traditional healthcare settings to actually provide healthcare. 
And then, you know, there are uh, a lot of uh, system, uh, mm. sort of a wide approach that we have to reconsider and visit. Uh, in the recent months, of course, uh, the House Authority Chairman has been promoting uh, a lot of public, uh, and he's been talking in you know, several forums, many forums, in relation to public, uh, private uh, partnership. <laughs> But there's the need to actually revisit some of some uh, fundamental way we run our businesses as well, like in terms of payment reforms, in terms of uh, areas that we may require uh, changes in government regulations and uh, 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 and all whatnot. Yeah. So these are the system changes that we anticipate we have to introduce. Uh, and in our healthcare context, uh, uh, it is um, uh, uh, this is. Uh, I mean, it was seen to be an aftermath, but it's actually not an aftermath, it's actually going on at the, you know, uh, uh, all the while, uh, while we are fighting or uh, compacting the, the virus, the pandemic, uh, <laughs> especially, for example, in the mainland, uh, uh, since uh, COVID-19, since the pandemic, uh, the, uh, the, the government, uh, the central government has actually strengthened and then reinforced uh, policies and regulations in relation to the development of internet hospitals uh, as a way of actually improving the accessibility and also uh, the ensuring the quality of health, uh, supporting the original uh, drive for uh, sort of a deepening, the strengthening uh, the pace and also the dimensions in relation to health system reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so these are kind of things that we are looking at, especially making use of the digital uh, uh, capability to transform how healthcare is going to be delivered, especially uh, in relation to primary care and health and wellness, and also access to, to care. So these are the things that we're looking at from a health system perspective. Yeah? And then for last but not the least, in relation to uh, leadership, you know, uh, Professor Anthony Chen also mentioned something about the leadership. I think uh, vigilance is important. While, uh, like in our whole sort of uh, course of compacting the disease, we rely heavily on um, uh, sort of uh, evidence, especially evidence uh, generated uh, from the public health dimension. And the public health uh, 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 based decision making has been the hallmark of Hong Kong's sort of uh, 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 fight against uh, the COVID uh, so far. A uh, lot of the government decisions, uh, whether uh, it's opening the restaurant, closing the restaurant or whatever, are actually uh, based on public health recommendations. And uh, But we have to be agile you know, because, you know, uh, it built on these evidences you know, uh, to build uh, agility because that's important uh, for uh, sort of uh, resilience. We have to be very focused, very focused in terms of uh, Treasuring every life, making sure that no one is left behind. And of course, uh, 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 at the present moment, we do uh, treat this sort of as the, our primary objective, you know, uh, and then uh, uh, most important, more important than even the economy. Yeah? Uh, but I think uh, on the whole, you know, I believe he said so far we can address health. You know, then the wealth will follow. Yeah. If we don't uh, sort of protect health well, uh, you know, sufficient way, uh, you know, there's no wealth. And then last but not the least is actually the use of technology and innovations that will be able to help us to strike the balance at the end of the day between health security and also economic vitality. I think that's all I want to cover. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hong, and uh, lots of great insights from health science pers perspective. And now may I invite the third speaker, Professor Xun Wu from the uh, HKUST, and Professor Wu as an expert, you know, who used to be based in Singapore for long. So he will bring in some Singapore per perspective as well. So Professor, Professor Wu, please. Thank you. OK. Um... Yeah, thank you very much um, for uh, inviting me uh, to uh, the seminar. Can you uh, can you see the uh, shared screen here? For, yes, clear. For my, for my slide. Okay. Yeah. So, um, my name is Wu Xiang from the uh, Division of Public Policy with uh, HKUST, and uh, so I'd like to uh, actually talk about uh, a few issues touched upon um, by uh, Professor Chan's uh, uh, the discussion earlier right, about the uh, various of. Uh, uh, policy uh, dilemma. So I, I would like to uh, frame it in terms of option 
and the and the trade off because a lot of time uh, we try to find areas where we can get win win solution win 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 solution but in reality in policy choices here we have to deal with uh, trade off the trade off mean that uh, if we get something in certain area we have to be prepared uh, to make sacrifice uh, in other area here I'd like to talk about these uh, trade off. Okay, so um, I'd like to focus my talks on the um, border closing and in the context of uh, uh, opening up, reopening up of uh, Hong Kong. So if you uh, know the uh, current arrangement, Hong Kong has closed border for non-residents right, since March uh, 2020. Uh, so basically people who are allowed to travel back are the Hong Kong uh, residents uh, or you know people who are working here have other uh, relationship uh, with you know family here or, or or you know working here and the Hong Kong require now uh, 21 days of quarantine for traveler uh, from the high risk places here and uh, if you look at the, the current categorization here most of the country in the world are categorized as high risk places here so so this is a uh, we really we can categorize so far as as a border closing, right? And and uh, this has you know of course significant impact uh, on the flow of traveler to Hong Kong. Uh, this shows you uh, the uh, monthly passenger arrival in Hong Kong International Airport here um, since um, since January uh, 2020, right? So if you look at the really uh, significant. Uh, reductions uh, in terms of passengers uh, coming through uh, international airport. And also, um, more importantly, uh, really uh, significant reduction in terms of uh, passengers uh, traveling from uh, the mainland China, right? So uh, in 2019, uh, daily averages about, uh, daily averages about, you know, 640,000 uh, travelers uh, crossing uh, the borders in you know, various places uh, in in uh, um, uh, in Hong Kong right, between uh, 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 Shenzhen and uh, uh, and Hong Kong and also uh, Hong Kong to High Macau Bridge. Um, uh, so so that you know because of the mainland border uh, uh, closing, uh, this is, has very much of uh, uh, minimized in in terms of uh, in terms of this this flow. So what might be the, the kind of implication uh, of that? I would say that there are several importance for Hong Kong uh, to consider uh, opening the travel links. Uh, this is something touched upon by uh, Professor Chan uh, in uh, his discussion as well. Um, I think at least there are you know, three uh, compelling reasons um, for Hong Kong to consider that. One is uh, to maintain its status as an international financial hub against the backdrop of uh, reopening of other major cities with financial hub, Singapore, London, and other places here with international financial hub have reopened. So, so this is actually, uh, you know, kind of impose enormous pressures on Hong Kong to maintain its status. Um, the second is maintain the status as a home for regional headquarters and the gateway for China for many uh, multinational uh, companies here, right? Many of their headquarters here, and uh, uh, and, and a lot of people have the needs um, to travel both uh, to China as well as to the rest of the world here. Um, if this situation uh, continue, if the the borders closing remains uh, in place here, this could potentially have a you know um, um, will threaten uh, as a status. Uh, in, in, in that regard. And then the third is maintaining the competitiveness in trading in terms of commerce and the tourism, right? Uh, so, so I think this is a, a quite important for Hong Kong um, to consider uh, reopening travel links. So if you look at uh, um, that uh, need uh, in terms of reopening Hong Kong, I would you know, say that there are uh, two options uh, that can be, can be considered here. This is also uh, something mentioned by uh, Professor Anthony Chan. Um, one is to seeking uh, mainland borders reopening here. We have been waiting uh, for quite a long time. And uh, you, you, it was hopeful earlier in December that uh, the partial opening uh, might be uh, in sight. 
Um, but because of Omicron and also because of the new cases rising in China, uh, this would uh, uh, be postponed, right? So, so that is the kind of the one option. The second option, of course, is removing uh, travel ban to all residents and the easing uh, uh, quarantine uh, requirement here, right? So, so, so that would be looking at uh, uh, the opening, right, to the uh, to the rest of the world. Um, so, those are two options here. Yeah, in my view, um, both option uh, both option can greatly enhance Hong Kong's economic performance. Yeah. So be quite important in addressing some needs that I mentioned earlier, right? Both can be very, very important because of the, you know, uh, the level of economic integration between Hong Kong and mainland China, as well as integration between Hong Kong and the rest of the world, right? Um, but it's unlikely that Hong Kong can successfully pursue both uh, at the same time. Uh, so that's why I, you know, kind of, I, I frame this issue as an option here. Of course, I didn't mention the other option, uh, which is essentially status quo, just remains uh, as that it is, uh, not really uh, uh, reopening uh, anytime soon. That would be uh, kind of the the default choices or the what, what I call status quo. So we all know how difficult it is actually uh, to pursue the mainland border uh, reopening here, right? Because like I mentioned before, um, the last year there were, Numerous times, uh, we thought that uh, Hong Kong um, was quite close to reach that threshold of reopening here. Um, but, you know, it, it is quite difficult to reach that threshold and also uh, very difficult uh, to uh, to sustain that here. So there are various reasons why uh, that task is a very difficult. One is um, the Hong Kong and the mainland China have different approach and measures, right? Uh, when, comes to uh, curtail uh, COVID, right? Uh, for example, uh, Hong Kong has never really imposed the strict lockdown any time, right, in, in, the, in the last two years here as uh, compared to uh, many cities in China. This is a, a very, very different approach, right? And also uh, Hong Kong's very active uh, in look, you know, contact tracing and so forth here, but the much less uh, extent compared to uh, the approach used in uh, mainland China towards uh, zero COVID here. So there are still, you know, significant differences in approach and measure here. And also uh, the differences in the uh, political system under the uh, one country, uh, two system uh, arrangement here. There's also different institutional uh, cultures. So this can be quite important when it comes to um, some of the trade-off, um, for example, between effectiveness versus the privacy uh, and other values, right? How uh, these different values that uh, would be uh, prioritized, emphasized here, uh, this would ultimately uh, really uh, determine by uh, how the political system uh, fits uh, those values and uh, consider uh, the weightages here. So, so that is actually also matter a great deal. And the implementation capacity can be also uh, quite important. Uh, we see uh, how effective in mainland China uh, where the contact tracing <clears throat> can be made. And then also uh, during a very short period of time, uh, mass testing can be conducted here. Um, we haven't seen that uh, in Hong Kong yet. And, and, and I think that there are the differences here in terms of implementation. Uh, capacity. The you know, difference in level of global linkage is quite different here. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, Hong Kong's last two years, um, the international flight, uh, you know, keep coming in, and and that there are, you know, uh, really potentially significant more risk because of that uh, high level of uh, uh, global linkages. Right, um, and then th the most important thing is that uh, this uh, reopening will require very high level of coordination, integration, standardization, in contact tracing, and, uh, and the, the uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, the, the digital technology used, and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, even if it reopen, it is also very difficult to sustain that, right, uh, because of these differences here. And in comparison, I would say that uh, uh, to removing travel ban for all uh, non-residences and and also easing a quarantine requirement might be uh, might be more realistic goal. Uh, one is that impose a limited direct impact on mainland China, 
due to mainland border closing. And also, this is something that uh, that Hong Kong, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the special administrative uh, uh, the, the areas can actually, uh, the government can uh, decide, uh, can have a, a kind of a, a control in its uh, policy with regard to this issue here. And uh, also, um, I think it can be a potentially useful pilot cases within China. Right? Um, if you look at success of many areas of policy in China, uh, piloting uh, has played a very important role. Uh, typically, uh, some of the controversial policy has been tested in uh, certain places before they uh, can be rolled out in, in nationwide. When it comes to you know, um, COVID-19, uh, public crisis like this one, is of course, it's, a very, it's a, uh, a very difficult to do piloting uh, like this one because of the nature of being global and being, uh, you know, uh, spreading across the country here. But I think, uh, you know, due, uh, due to the border uh, arrangement between uh, mainland China and Hong Kong, uh, this can potentially uh, be a useful pilot cases uh, if uh, the Hong Kong government or if the central government uh, decide uh, to do so. Um, but we have to keep in mind that this is something that I, I emphasized earlier about the trade-off rather than so-called win-win situation here. Uh, potentially, there will be a surge of infected cases here and also uh, increased deaths uh, due to uh, COVID here. So this is uh, uh, something also mentioned by Professor Fong uh, in his discussion about the Singapore case. You can kind of see that the actual uh, infected cases have risen and also uh, the deaths also have risen here. So so this is the kind of the trade-off that uh, that the the government have to consider. The, the last issue, uh, of course, is it, it, it entails significant political risk uh, for the government. Right. So, um, just just like uh, uh, Professor He uh, mentioned, I um, I spent uh, uh, quite some time uh, in Singapore before I joined uh, HKUST. As a matter of fact, I'm right now. Uh, uh, in a hotel in Hong Kong um, for 21 days quarantine after spending 10 days uh, in Singapore. So I would say that uh, uh, you know uh, the, the memories are still quite fresh in terms of uh, uh, that my experiences uh, in 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 kind of a, uh, understanding uh, various of measures in Singapore and so that I um, make some. Uh, comparisons and, and, and also to look at the issues um, from the perspective of uh, what might be the lessons we can um, learn from Singapore, right? So I would like to um, uh, present um, something from the Prime Minister Li Xianlong's um, uh, uh, talks. Uh, I think this is uh, back in October uh, last year, right? Um, when he talked about the uh, significant changes in strategies uh, towards COVID here, right? So um, he, you know, mentioned that a zero COVID was the right strategy uh, then at the time, right? Uh, when when the countries uh, first interact with this uh, uh, this pandemic here, uh, so he said that our original approach uh, was to do our utmost to prevent Singaporeans from being exposed. At that time, uh, there was no uh, vaccine yet, right? So, so zero COVID was the right strategy at the time. And also the strategy uh, succeeded uh, early and uh, Singapore actually have one of the lowest COVID deaths rates in the world. But then, um, for the decision makers in Singapore, uh, vaccination uh, is game changers, right? So, so uh, things uh, change uh, drastically or very differently uh, after the populations uh, get vaccinated, and also vaccin vaccination rate become quite high. This is uh, this is as of uh, August uh, last year, right? If you look at the how uh, the vaccination have steadily increased uh, in uh, in Singapore, this is a uh, um, you know, um, not just uh, for uh, particular age groups here. This is across different age groups here, right? I mean, even including, you know, uh, people who are 60 years above and 70 years above, um, this is actually, uh, they are able to reach a very high level of uh, uh, vaccination rate here. Uh, 
um, by November last year, uh, 96% of the country's eligible population has been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, right? So the interesting question is how Singapore achieved that, right? Uh, in comparison to Hong Kong, um, we you know, we look at vaccination in, in uh, between Singapore and Hong Kong. There's a huge differences here. So uh, these are some of the measures used uh, in Singapore uh, to increase the vaccination rate here. Uh, when it's to fighting uh, the fake news of here, there's a lot of fake news about the uh, the detrimental side effects of uh, of getting vaccination, and uh, so the you know, the government need to uh, make a lot of efforts uh, to fighting those um, fake news here and uh, to come up with a more, you know, scientific explanation, uh, more convincing understanding and uh, and uh, to communicate to the general public here. And persuading the elderly, this is a very, very difficult uh, uh, task, actually. Um, sometimes the, the elderly uh, worry about their uh, current health condition, whether or not there are uh, significant side effects and so forth here. And uh, you know they have make a lot of efforts uh, in persuading the elderly um, that you know are, you know they are actually uh, have uh, these uh, um, you know uh, cars, uh, buses, or, or went around the communities and speaking you know those different languages uh, depending on ethnic groups the elderly are from. Yeah, Singapore is a multi-ethnic. Uh, uh, countries uh, have, you know, uh, like the Chinese and Malays and other ethnic groups here. So, so, so that you know, significant efforts have been made in th that regard, and uh, making vaccine widely accept accessible. Now, one of the uh, things in Singapore is that you actually don't really need, uh, uh, you know, a book the uh, uh, vaccine uh, nations right to to go to those uh, uh, centers to get vaccinated here yeah, that they are uh, widely accessible and uh, uh, the other uh, two um, strategy that uh, they use more recently right one is to making unvaccinated pay um, it used to be the case the government will cover the covid related treatment um, but now, you know, government already made the policy where people who choose not to get vaccinated would have to pay for those treatment by themselves. So that's another strategy used. And uh, imposing restriction on unvaccinated, um, uh, Singapore started to bar unvaccinated people from entering shopping mall uh, from mid-October last year. And uh, then um, from January uh, 1st of this year, uh, only vaccinated individual can enter workplace. Right? So those are the various of, uh, uh, I would say, soft and hard approach in getting uh, vaccinated rate high in Singapore. So um, what was the thinking of the Singapore in terms of moving from zero COVID strategy uh, to, uh, to the strategy of uh, uh, live with COVID? Right. So, so this is again quoted from um, Prime, um, Prime Minister Li Xianlong's uh, speech, and uh, he said, "Yet yeah, Singapore cannot stay locked down and the closing off indefinitely. Right? Uh, it would not work. It would be very costly. It would be unable to resume life, participate in social activity, open border, and revive uh, the economy. Right? So, so, so he can explain sort of what might be." Uh, the reason uh, for not doing that, and uh, uh, especially given that uh, uh, such a high percentage of population have already developed immunities against COVID-19, uh, so that the government decided that uh, zero COVID strategy is no longer feasible. Right? It's not necessarily uh, that this is something that uh, perhaps particularly desirable, but not feasible at that, that time. Um, so change the strategy to living with uh, COVID. Okay, so, so, so if you look at, uh, you know, some of the measure here, when we're talking about reopening uh, uh, the country, right, uh, they introduced what they call the uh, VTL lane, vaccinated travel lane here, right, since September last year. Uh, if you are vaccinated, um, that you, you can apply it uh, to get this VTL. So the eligible vaccinated traveler can enjoy quarantine free entry to Singapore if they meet the requirement here. 
and then the the VTL country or regions are quite uh, extensive, right? Quite quite a lot of these countries here uh, are included uh, in this. Um, but of course, in you know, like just last month, uh, because of uh, the potential uh, the rising right, number of uh, uh, Omicron cases here, uh, the there there there's no no new ticket sales for VTL line until uh, 20th January here, yeah, right? And so, so, so that's also they recently made some changes due to the uh, the the threats imposed by the Omicron. But even you know, um, without the VTL arrangement here, there are also you know um, some of the arrangements for non uh, VTL arrangement here. So, so you notice that category one right uh, is actually applied to people who travel from Hong Kong, Macau, mainland China, uh, and Taiwan. Uh, so there's really uh, no uh, quarantine requirement at all. Like recently I went to Singapore, I stayed in an airport for two hours and uh, got you know, tested here. Then I was allowed uh, to, uh, to go to the hotel. Um, for waiting uh, for the results uh, for the PCR, right? So if you are from the category one, but then you are from a category two and three, there's a, of course, I mean, if a non-VTL arrangement here, there's uh, still some uh, quarantine requirement, um, but 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 this is much, much less stringent than mm-hmm. what was before. One thing that I find quite surprising in Singapore is that the social distancing measure remain in place, right? Despite of the fact that, that they open borders and that the travelers can come in, uh, if they are vaccinated here, they can enjoy you know, a quarantine-free uh, stay or visit in Singapore. But the social distancing measure within the country remain quite tight, right? So, so this is, for, for example, um, until uh, November 22nd, Mm-hmm. Last year, uh, the if you want to go to the restaurant here, and then the the group size can only up to two. This is before November twenty second here, right? And and also in terms of a workplace, that I was quite surprised when I talked to uh, the different friends working for the government, universities, and so forth here. And uh, this is uh, in at the end of September here. They told me that. Uh, you know, uh, they haven't really come back to workplaces. They have been working from home for the last two years. And some of them just, you know, start to come back uh, to the office here. So, so those are uh, kind of, if you look at uh, some kind of, uh, maybe some kind of contradiction, right? If you look at the, on one hand, um, Singapore consider the opening the borders, right? Reopening is a matter of uh, economic survival. At the same time, they're still imposing quite strict social distancing measures internally, right? This is also indicate perhaps uh, something that uh, uh, you, if we were looking uh, this option more closely here, this is another kind of trade-off that people have to be prepared to make as well, right? Um, if you kind of think about why Singapore uh, continues to impose a very high level of uh, social distancing measure here. Um, you know, I, I want to show you that uh, uh, this is, you know, what, what are the, the kind of key considerations that the Singapore government uh, use uh, in deciding right, to what extent that uh, uh, the openings, uh, the measures can be made and to what extent that the social distancing measures can be um, um, eased. So, if you look at the last year, right, um, after the uh, reopening of uh, Singapore, uh, there was a surge of cases, of course, in part related to Delta, right? Uh, the, 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 the outbreak, uh, Delta outbreak uh, worldwide. And uh, there are very high uh, number of cases uh, at the end of October and in November, if you look at this, is really very really high cases. I uh, mean, reached to you know over uh, five thousand cases at, at, the, at the one particular instance here, right? So, so this you know uh, was during that period. If you look at the very very high number of infection every day. But then you know, Singapore government look at uh, several uh, statistics quite carefully in deciding uh, what to do the next. Yeah. 
is the preparedness of the person. They look at the, uh, the, the number of ICU uh, units used, ICU bed used uh, during the period here. So, so if you look at, uh, you know, indeed, there are, you know, significant um, the usages uh, in terms of ICU bed during that period here. But there's still a spare capacity. If you look at it, there are still, you know, significant percentage of these beds are used for other purpose and or are uh, empty, right? So, we, which means that they, they still keep uh, these capacities uh, to to kind of deal with uh, critical ill cases here. That I think is a quite important right, in terms of uh, understanding uh, what to do in terms of opening up here. And uh, if you adopt evidence based approach here, this is something that uh, that the government have to. Uh, keep an eye on is that uh, uh, this opening up or relaxing of social distancing measure will not overwhelm your public health system here. This is the one aspect. The other aspect have to do with protecting the elderly. This is another aspect that you have to be keeping a very close eye on, right? Because uh, uh, the elderly uh, are more vulnerable. Right, to the potential outbreak here, right? If if the potential outbreak leads to significant rise of the deaths for elderly here, that's uh, that's that's you know, uh, uh, you know a catastrophe, right? So so here this is another aspect where they look at the deaths, they look at uh, uh, for example uh, the deaths related to, uh, for for people who are vaccinated and uh, not vaccinated. If you look at the statistics, indeed as a uh, Professor Fong mentioned earlier, uh, if you are vaccinated, right, the possibility uh, of people who got critically ill after getting infected here is much, much lower. And also in terms of uh, death rate here uh, for fully vaccinated uh, is also much, much lower than people who are not vaccinated here. So so those are kind of statistics that they uh, keep very closely uh, to try to make a balance in terms of uh, uh, economic benefits, uh, economic survival um, versus the protection of your public health system. That is a very important aspect. And also the health of three dimension. They are quite important here. Right? Like I mentioned before, it is a very difficult to reach the status, you can truly, let's say, do win-win-win. Right? So every aspect that you will perform the best. You have to do some, uh, make some trade-off here. But more important here, you need to make some right balances um, for the locality. The other aspect I'm quite impressed uh, with Singapore's responses have to do with the public communication efforts here. Right? So if you look at mm-hmm. the, um, you know, the cases of uh, of uh, preparing the public um, for the uh, outbreak related to the reopening up of the Singapore, right? Because when the open borders, and the foreseeably you you will see much more cases here, and you will see much more deaths also, right? So so this is what the uh, you know sort of quoted from his speech. He would say. Uh, the cases could uh, hit as high as the uh, five thousands and uh, around hundred to be, you know, serious ill. That's a uh, you know, quite quite a big number. And also uh, try to uh, discuss with the public about uh, the the risk uh, of dying of COVID, uh, comparing with the risk of dying from others here, like uh, pneumonia, for example. He said every year more than four thousand people die from pneumonia, mostly outlaid with other. Uh, underlying illness, right? So, so, so this is basically looking at uh, you know, putting this issue uh, in a perspective here. But more importantly, uh, that the government used the potential crisis as an opportunity to get people to get vaccinated here, right? To argue that uh, people need to protect themselves, and the best way to protect themselves is to get vaccinated. Right. The other example uh, of uh, using the public communication to prepare the public and getting public support. Yeah, this is the, um, you know, uh, based, based on more recent uh, speech. This is by Singapore's health minister. So, uh, he said, if Delta infection reached a sustained incidence of about 3,000 cases a day, Omicron could perhaps reach 
10,000 or 15,000 cases a day or more, right? So, so, so this essentially is that, uh, uh, you know, they alert the public about the potential danger, potential risk, and so forth here, getting people to be prepared right, um, for the potential outbreak. Uh, outbreak. So I'd like to uh, just end my talk by uh, looking at uh, some of the learning points um, in terms of uh, in terms of roadmap towards reopening Hong Kong. Um, the first is the building public support for reopening Hong Kong, because uh, this is, after all, one of the options Hong Kong mm -hmm. can take. Uh, one of the options Hong Kong can still take is maintain the status quo, not open. Right? So, so that if is to be, uh, if the option is to consider seriously, then there are serious implications, right? Surge of cases and the potential increase of that. These are things that are, you know, uh, that the public have to understand what's involved in 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 in, um, in this option. So if you don't have the public support on this, yeah, then this you know uh, cannot be sustained. Then the second thing, very important, is to overcoming uh, vaccine hesitancies. Yeah. So if you look at this comparison, uh, where is Hong Kong? Where is Singapore? Right. We um, often like to draw comparison um, between the two uh, uh, because of their size, because of the economic uh, development sta uh, um, stage. There are quite uh, a lot of similarity. Uh, between the two, uh, Hong Kong, you know, is far behind uh, in terms of uh, the vaccination rate. Right. So, so I think that this is a uh, you know, critical aspect here. More worrying is the uh, the percentage of elderly uh, get fully vaccinated here. Right. So, so this show that uh, uh, up to now, if you look at people age seventy and above, there's a less than forty percent of people. Are fully vaccinated here compared to Singapore. The cases here over ninety percent have been vaccinated um, for that age group here. So, so that's actually the significant difference. I would say that uh, uh, if Hong Kong adopts similar strategies as in Singapore, uh, then you know it can be a catastrophic situation when it comes to the protection of the elderly here, simply because the vaccination rate of that vulnerable group. Is still very low. Right, so that's actually um, uh, one one very important aspect here, and the link to the uh, the uh, vaccine hesitation here. I would say making contact tracing app mandatory can be uh, quite important here, right? Because here, um, one you know, the, if you look at experiences of Singapore here, they use both soft and hard uh, kind of measures in terms of getting vaccination rate high here. So, so this is a uh, in in many in many uh, countries actually uh, they make the vaccination uh, mandatory, um, but but I think this is a, perhaps not many countries in Asia would prepare uh, to go that route. But then I think a contact tracing app uh, can play a very important role um, because within the contact tracing app here uh, you can uh, make the vaccination uh, record as a part of very important aspect. Of using that app here, not 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 really for the purpose of contact tracing, but also you know mostly in terms of using it as a tool uh, for you know so-called vaccine passport. Um, then uh, controlling community transmission with social distancing measure will continue to be important here. Like I mentioned before, the opening up means that uh, uh, more efforts need to be done in controlling community transmission here, right? Because of the potential risk involved here. So that uh, uh, this is one aspect, also trade off that uh, that the uh, you know government have to consider seriously. And the last thing is strengthening health facility for hospitalization of COVID patients here. Right. So there will be the rise of cases. Some of them uh, critical cases, uh, ill cases would require medical attention, and whether or not the health facility uh, are ready for that, this is uh, also open to question here. So, so uh, you know, those are various of a critical uh, component, a critical aspect to consider uh, if um, Hong Kong is seriously considered reopening uh, as one of the options moving forward. Okay, I guess I'll just uh, uh, stop my sharing here. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor Wu. Great insights. And uh, so, dear audience, we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. If, if there are multiple questions, we can, you know, certainly extend the session for a while. So please feel free to type because this webinar, sorry, we are not able to unmute you, but feel free to uh, type your questions in the chat box. And uh, please also identify actually which speaker this question goes to. Professor Wu, Professor Chen, and, and Professor Fang. So before the audience is, I guess they'll need time to warm up and phrase the, the question. So I would like to ask the first question to, uh, to Professor Jiang. Um, every person in Hong Kong knows the, this fifth you know, wave originated from Pathy Pacific, you know, the two att air attendants, which brought Omicron in. And then there has been some sort of criticism, resentment, especially given that the, the government has been using taxpayers' money to bail out the airlines with billions of dollars. And but others say that there's no perfect, you know, there are always loopholes. And then the civil aviation industry is so badly hit. And then we owe these people some kind of, you know, sympathy and so on. So as a, you know, former uh, transport minister, I think you know the dilemma much better. So what is your view on this recent saga? Thanks. Well, I think the the they can. Well, I won't speak uh, specifically uh, specifically on uh, the two uh, uh, issues involved because I don't have the full knowledge. But uh, there seems to be two kinds of so-called loopholes in this aspect. First, uh, there is a clear uh, decision on what exemptions should be allowed. Now, if eventually such exemptions have led to uh, an expected level of spread of the COVID, then of course people will ask, well, why were those exemptions initially allowed? Then government has to justify the decision made because the government could say, well, at the beginning, when we made a decision that was based on scientific advice, we have weighed the pros and cons because any decision cannot be a win-win. I mean, as what uh, Professor uh, Wu has said, so very often it's a balance of uh, risk and uh, imperatives, mm. which are important to your way of life, in, uh, economy, and so on and so forth. So government can explain, well, this is why exceptions, exemptions were originally allowed. And in fact, exemptions for air crews or shipping crew, that was, those kinds of exemptions were quite common across different countries and jurisdictions. Now, the other type of uh, loophole relates to actually uh, uh, certain requirements being imposed on airline staff. And if those airline staff did not follow or comply with the requirements, that was a real uh, breach of uh, 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 restrictions. And that should be uh, followed up and uh, uh, those uh, staff involved should be uh, sanctioned. Mm. So uh, I think in the current situation, of course, uh, it involves uh, crew members not really following the Cathay Pacific company advice. So of course, those have to be dealt with and whether or not uh, Cathay Pacific had the capacity to really enforce uh, such requirements. But on the other hand, if, uh, there, was, if there is a clear uh, decision on certain exemptions, I think government should explain them and then, of course, exemptions can always be reviewed based on the latest uh, development of the COVID. Mm. Thank you, Professor. And then we have collected two questions from the chat box. The first is uh, from Yu Tong Chao. And uh, so actually, he has asked the multiple questions. Uh, the, the you know, first question goes to Professor Jiang. How do these two categories of policy influence the sustainable development? Taking Hong Kong policy as an example, how the government factor when low political trust affects the sustainability of the long-term perspective. And also the second question, uh, the, the second part of the question also goes to Professor Pong. Um, what kind of long-term sustainable strategy can be derived from COVID? Uh, Long-term strategy. I think it's very difficult to talk about long-term. Uh, 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 our experience from uh, previous pandemics, uh, including uh, SARS, swine flu, or even more, you know, is that uh, every pandemic is different. And the other thing is uh, um, 
uh, even for example, within the current pandemic, uh, each uh, Delta uh, variant of the virus actually need to have a different effect uh, from a system perspective. So you can't say, you know, uh, the measure that we take uh, the, uh, the uh, system that we established from one pandemic will always be applicable to uh, the others. Right? Uh, like what we had learned from SARS, uh, it was back in 2003. Uh, and after that, we actually uh, built up a contingency plan, built up a lot of capacity. Yeah. But in the face of uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, 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 the measures, the things that we installed uh, in uh, during after SARS, uh, actually was not much use, yeah. except for example, the institute arrangement of having the uh, center for uh, health protection. Mm. So in terms of long-term, I think uh, uh, my, last point is still important, and that is, I think at the present moment, uh, there are few things in Hong Kong which is important. And that is, first, we do have very uh, strong uh, public health uh, sort of uh, expertise mm -hmm. and also research base that help us to generate uh, evidence to support uh, uh, relevant or related policies mm. uh, as we go along. I think that's important. Uh, the second thing that we now know, have learned, is that we do have the uh, agility you know, uh, to actually introduce uh, 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 necessary uh, infrastructure and also uh, sort of uh, uh, facilities very quickly. For example, you know, this is evident by, by the uh, quick uh, building construction of the community uh, uh, treatment center in Lantau area, you know, just 800 beds just to sort of build in uh, sort of for, sort of uh, within a very short time, mm. uh, short four months. I mean, of course, it's not as fast in, in mainland China as in Wuhan, but still it is actually a, a, a record. And also sort of uh, it's actually a, a demonstration of a high sort of efficiency mm. uh, and capability in terms of uh, responsiveness. This is the uh, second point. And I think uh, don't rem we also uh, don't have to, uh, shouldn't overlook the activity on the digital side as well. And, and although at the present moment, uh, the government is not introducing a lot of mandatory sort of required uh, measures you know, on the digital side because of uh, uh, in with the view to try to sort of protect uh, privacy as much as possible. So we do have that and we know that actually would help us I think we should continue with that sort of capability. Uh, the third measure, which I think, uh, actually, which I echo uh, Professor Anthony Chen and also uh, Professor Wu, uh, is in relation to, uh, uh, Anthony mentioned about crisis uh, uh, leadership. I think perhaps it's not so much leadership. What well, Hong Kong's weak at the, all the time in the face of crisis is really communication, right? not leadership per se. I mean, I could see that, for example, in Singapore, I, every time when uh, 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 the PM, uh, Li Xianlong, give a speech and also the minister give a speech, I always follow. I've all followed very closely and they give very nice speech, very convincing, very well communicated. Uh, I mean, at the standard, which is actually way beyond our own sort of local leaders, you see. Uh, and uh, you see, but you don't see consistent policy in Singapore. Like mm. uh, they say, back to normal. What does it mean by back to normal? It's opening the border back to normal, and yet, you know, uh, stringent, as pointed out by Professor Wu, mm. stringent social measures, you know, two person at the table, that sort of thing has been introduced all the time. The policies are not consistent, you can see. This is not back to normal. Yeah? Mm. And, so, and so, but they do communicate very well. And I think this is probably in the long run, something eventually, yeah, uh, uh, this, is, this, this is actually always to be in the face of crisis, probably the weakest link. Yeah, so I, I think uh, Professor Fang's response very nicely leader to a question raised by our colleague Chris Hartley. And he mentioned that, you know, the rest of the world is, has almost decided to co-live with, with COVID. And then in both mainland and Hong Kong, political leaders often use capacity, hospital capacity as a sort of reason so that why we cannot, you know, open really back to normal. So the question was, to what extent is this so-called overwhelmed hospital capacity truly the biggest concern in Hong Kong? 
I think the bigger concern, I mean, that's the concern, but not the biggest concern. The bigger concern is still the health of the people, the potential, I mean, uh, once you uh, don't get the thing under control, you will have a lot of people uh, getting the virus, a lot of people getting sick and a lot of mortality, especially among the elderly. That's the biggest concern, uh, not the so-called the capacity per se. Uh, and I think at the present moment, why we, uh, a lot of uh, the system, uh, our people are still sort of seeing very stringent and tight measure, and that is because we do, uh, I mean, uh, probably a lot of people overlook that uh, we are in a position to be able to contain and control the virus. And like, for example, in the United States, UK, Europe at the present moment, there's no chance they will have it under control anymore. And then, therefore, you know, that they, probably totally different policy, which is totally different from here. Uh, mm. And uh, but here, you know, because despite, for example, we got the Cafe Pacific to crew members spreading, uh, maybe perceived to be spreading the virus in the community, but we do have measures, speedy responses that enable us to have it controlled, you know, mm. and also contain the spread within the community very, in a very mm -hmm. efficient manner. And so, and uh, uh, this is something that we can do. And we, it proved that you know, after learning from the fourth wave that we're able to uh, do well. Yeah, thanks, Professor Fong. And we received a question from Herbert Ip, and uh, I think Professor Zhang and Professor Wu are in a good position to answer that question. Suppose one day, you know, the uh, mainland Hong Kong border, you know, reopens. What would be the next overall strategy with the link with the rest of the world? Professor Wu and Professor Zhang, please. Uh, okay, maybe I, I, I'll, I'll speak first. And I would like to go back to one of the earlier questions regarding low political trust and government performance. I think the case of Hong Kong, uh, the reason for the present low level of trust uh, is more complicated. And it's not because of COVID per se, mm. it's data beyond uh, before COVID. But then uh, I don't think uh, if you just look at government performance during COVID, if people know the real situation, if uh, government uh, has communicated better, maybe. In fact, the whole process could have added to trust. But of course, uh, there, there are various reasons uh, which make uh, uh, the Hong Kong's overall performance not fully appreciated. Because if we compare Hong Kong to other places, in fact, we have been doing relatively well. Mm -hmm. And in other countries uh, or cities, leaders will have taken credit for what has been achieved. Mm -hmm. But in the case of Hong Kong, because of uh, the more complicated political situation, therefore, uh, sometimes we do not uh, give uh, a, a, a sort of credit to, to where it is due. Mm. But of course, uh, the, the, the vigilance of uh, our medical system, the, the frontline personnel, of course, that is also very important. But coming back to the current situation, in, in coping with a prolonged crisis, and given that we are not able to tell when COVID will end. Now, we have been with this crisis for uh, more than two years. There will be crisis fatigue, COVID fatigue, and also organizational fatigue. Mm. Not just the overall capacity of our hospital system, but because we have been fighting the pandemic, we've been in this high level of alert for more than two years. It's like human body is so tightened up. So therefore, we must not underestimate uh, more occasions, more incidences of non-compliance, resistance, skepticism merging, and that will hamper our future efforts. So we have come to a juncture. On the one hand, the rest of the world seem to be moving towards some kind, some degree of coexistence. Hmm. But you have active coexistence or passive coexistence. Uh, in the case of Singapore, you have uh, lifted the ban of, uh, for international travel. At the same time, you have very stringent control of community uh, activities, social distancing. Hmm. So different countries still will have different strategies hmm. within this so-called coexistence uh, approach. Hmm. Now, ultimately, of course, if most of the world is going for coexistence if uh, the central government of China still uh, stick to uh, minimum uh, tolerance or zero tolerance, then we have to deal with rather two different scenarios at the same time. 
And I would tend to agree with Professor Wu that, well, it is not uh, that simple to try to achieve the win-win because in reality, we may not have the win-win. So can we have some partial decoupling there so that when we deal with the rest of the world, we may adopt a certain approach and then when we deal with uh, the opening the, the, the border with the mainland, then we have to uh, uh, think of a strategy, a, a, a package that may not necessarily be entirely linked to how we deal with other countries. Now that, that, that is a complicated thing mm. because it's not just a health risk, it's also about the political implications. But, but uh, looking into the future, Hong Kong cannot stick to the status quo because mm. I, I, in my view, the status quo is no longer uh, an option in the long run because the economy will suffer. And then you have other grievances coming up if the economy uh, does not perform. Mm. So, so it's not just a health issue. It's just not just uh, the surge capacity of our hospital system is what the Professor Fong has just said. Okay, thank you. So Professor Wu, any views on border reopening, especially with the rest of the world? Yeah, I think uh, I think my view is that I mentioned earlier. There's uh, if there's two option, I I I'm, I'm I'm doubtful that these two options can be pursued successfully uh, at the same time. So that I think uh, if reopening in China, if it happened here, that probably mean that uh, the reopening to the rest of the world they have uh, to uh, be be more cautious and uh, maybe even uh, further uh, postponed. I think right be, be, because there are yeah, sort of the inconsistencies uh, in terms of uh, overall strategy uh, in China uh, in comparison uh, to the other places here. So so but but having said that, I wanted to make uh, uh, a couple of other points here. One is that uh, the situation is still evolving. I think the policymakers in China and the public health specialists in China also uh, look at other countries' experiences quite carefully. Right? Because uh, if you look at uh, Omicron, for example, right, what how uh, the I think uh, how fast it spread and what are the uh, consequences people get affected. I mean, these are all evidences are quite important here, right? They're dealing with uh, unprecedented try uh, uh, to base our decision based on evidences, new evidences, right? Because these are not available uh, before. So, so I think that that's really kind of the strategy uh, of China and Hong Kong uh, would also are related to evidences that we get from uh, the uh, I think from the rest of the world that actually can be uh, quite important uh, uh, aspect here, right? I mean the other thing also I think that the rest of the world at the same time can also make changes here, right? If you look at the current situation, yes, there seem to be some kind of uh, direction the rest of the world has moved to here, but really. Uh, That a Delta uh, outbreak occurs, and there was uh, uh, much of the thinking that uh, the situation will move to be more tightening here. Right? It is only more recently with the, the Omicron and so forth here that the thinking become quite different here. So, so I don't, you know, I think even for the world, uh, we we think that there are potentially changes there as well. Thank you, Professor Wu. I think uh, I, I would like to invite Professor Jian to respond to the question raised by April Wu. Mm -hmm. So basically, what are the sort of time points in the future that we can expect a change in government policies in Hong Kong? Probably after Beijing Winter Olympic Games, <laughs> you know, or in the, the C election, or you know, what are, of course there's a great deal of uncertainties. So what are your general sort of feel? Well, I think um... The coming few months will be critical. As you said, uh, there are important events in Beijing. And after those events, maybe, and, and also at the same time as what the Professor Wu has said, uh, many experts are also reviewing the situation. And then I'm sure uh, officials are also uh, uh, monitoring the situation. So maybe uh, when the full impact of Omicron is clearer, mm. then perhaps, uh, 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 
new developments might, might take place. In the case of Hong Kong, of course, um, uh, we have uh, a, a, a chief executive election coming in March. Now, whether or not that might be mm. uh, mm. a turning point, I don't know. But I mean, even if uh, the currency stays on, I mean, a new term may uh, imply uh, a, a, a refreshing a refreshing of your know, existing uh, policies and, and, and positions. Mm. So, so that perhaps would be uh, uh, a, a, an opportunity for uh, 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 the performance uh, and how we look into the future. But then uh, I think it also depends on uh, what the rest of the world might do because of Omicron. Because by the end of last year, most countries seem to be um, working towards uh, a simpler form of coexistence. But mm. now it seems it's more complicated than that. Mm. Uh, but in any case, I think uh, it may not be that easy if we try to adopt a wholly consistent, uh, consistent approach vis-a-vis -vis the mainland and, vis -vis and the rest of the world. Mm. Because we are dealing with two rather different approaches. Mm. So can we sort of find a way whereby we can still uh, keep ourselves open to other countries at the same time we have to uh, risk sensitive the opening with the mainland. Mm. I think that that's something that we need to, to, to think further. Thank you, Professor. And we we'll keep it here. You know, uh, because uh, Anthony talked about this issue from the very con context, so the perspective of a political perspective. You see. Uh, but you could actually imagine the scenario, actually, you can foresee that uh, in several months' time, maybe in three, around three months' time, uh, Most countries you know, have gone through the epidemiological curve. Mm. Yeah, and then people will, uh, uh, for this country, will have developed uh, sort of uh, immunity against uh, at least the Omicron variant. Okay? And that's why, you know, there's actually uh, internationally, there's uh, public health. Uh, uh, Discussion and actually uh, uh, allow globally, you know, the start to appearance of like global immunity against mm -hmm. the virus. So uh, we don't know, we never know. And uh, uh, once that's happened, that it probably uh, provide an opportunity for what uh, Professor Wu seen to be a divergent of policy to be able to merge again mm -hmm. because uh, the scenario, the population scenario, the public, you know, the mm -hmm. public health scenario yeah, will, will be very different by then. So I think it will be, I mean, looking at the optimistic side, that would be an opportunity in which uh, the, some of the, the kind of policy will become, start to merge, uh, 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 not based on uh, politics. Again, it's actually based on public health alone. Yeah, we got uh, several other questions. Also, you know, some of them are related to vaccination. So probably we could invite Professor Fan. And for example, in particular, uh, the, it seems that after CNY break, the government will be sending outreach teams to schools to vaccinate school children, right? So what is your view on that? Would that work? Or how, well, how would you know, the, the parents be receptive to that idea? I, I support that, you know, because the evidence is that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the vaccine will protect, you know, it's not only protect the uh, children, it's uh, protect the elderly, it's also protect the children. Making sure uh, that the children will not get infected, uh, will be well protected, uh, uh, will have two advantages. It's not just for the purpose of the uh, health of the children, but it's also for the health of the elderly uh, they, when they live in the same home as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's important. And uh, uh, But I think, first of all, we just have to overcome the uh, the. Uh, the low vaccination rate among the elderly population. Yeah, and actually a couple of days ago, Professor Gabriel Leon suggests that we could use this so-called opt-out policy. So if uh, elderly, if you don't explicitly refuse to get vaccinated, the government will assume that you have 
you know, accepted the vaccine, you know, you're willing to get vaccinated. So would that kind of things work? Uh, I'm not sure about our, our policy, you know, but I think uh, uh, it's already, I mean, when the government say we're going to introduce a vaccine a bubble, uh, you have in order to go to restaurant and uh, to have uh, to yum cha, then you have to have the vaccine. I mean, that actually has uh, done a lot of uh, promotion, a lot, a lot of elderly actually coming to our vaccination center to be- starting to get vaccine because they thought that, you know, that if they cannot, you know, uh, go to Yamcha, it will be very bad. Yeah? I think that has a very positive effect yeah? mm. on vaccination rate. Okay, thank you. And uh, multiple other questions. I, I think the last one sounds interesting uh, by Mandy. Uh, so how could Hong Kong better prepare for next public health pandemic crisis? Professor Chair? Well, I think we learn from every crisis. Uh, so uh, to that extent, I think Hong Kong and even Singapore and some of the countries have learned from SARS. Uh, our emergency response system, in my view, has improved quite a lot compared to SARS 17 years ago. But of course, every pandemic, we're talking public health crisis, every pandemic brings uh, new issues mm. because they're not the same. And then, uh, so we cannot just stick to past uh, experience. Uh, sometimes if we are too uh, sort of uh, influenced by what we have gone through in the past uh, crisis, we might be overburdened. Mm. And that will shape the way we respond. Mm. So every new crisis, every new academic is a new challenge. Mm. So we have to bear that in mind as well. Yeah, and probably one last question also to Professor Chen. How, how effective is this so-called international collaboration, cross-boundary mm-hmm. collaboration? Well, if you look at this current uh, COVID pandemic, international cooperation uh, and closing of borders seems to be quite a serious issue. Mm-hmm. And while we we said earlier that the rest of the world is doing this or that, in fact, the rest of the world is not singular. (laughs) I mean, even in Europe, although most are sort of uh, de facto uh, accepting coexistence, but there are different uh, uh, ways of dealing with coexistence. Some are more laid back, some more sort of proactive, uh, some still take a rather regional approach whenever new infections are identified. So... uh, even of under a broad uh, sort of coexistence approach, there are different strategies because of national sentiments, because of the way they interpret the economic impact, the health risk, or their scientific evidence. Uh, because uh, the empirical situation is not entirely the same across countries. Uh, but we have come to a stage where I think perhaps more international cooperation in terms of adopting some common strategies or some basic common strategies to respond to COVID is necessary. If you look at, I mean, if I talk entirely from the economic angle, if you look at the global financial crisis over a decade ago, the whole reason why the world at that time had adjusted, adapted, to the global financial crisis and then sort of, I was a reason uh, China and the US were on much better terms than now. And then internationally speaking, somehow everybody realized that uh, the world must not must prevent a rehappening of mm. the 1929 crash. But this time, if we look at the role of WHO, uh, in my view, from the very beginning, the WHO was rather handicapped in terms of achieving that kind of international cooperation. Mm-hmm. So you have the experts in different countries. Uh, in some countries, the medical experts uh, have been more influential than other countries because of politics, because of, in, in some places, you have very strong sort of anti vet uh, lobby. In, but in the case of Hong Kong, I don't think we have that kind of problem in terms of anti-vac uh, uh, lobby. So, uh, so I agree with the other two speakers that perhaps we should focus more on achieving a high level of vaccination. All right, okay, thank you so much. Uh, Alex, Alex can, I, can I make a, a comment, yes, uh, a very quick comment, and really yeah, just to, uh, uh, I think to get back to one of the observations made by uh, Professor Fan, um, uh, that the, the Singapore policy seemed to be 
conflicting and seem to be inconsistent. I think that that's actually I I have been studying you know Singapore uh, uh, policy so for quite a long time. I I think I share that observation. Actually, I've uh, written work on the health policy and the transportation policy, and that inconsistency, uh, so to speak, is something that I find uh, uh, quite. Uh, consistent in terms of Singapore policy making here. So, so that, uh, when, what my, my finding is that uh, in any policy that you take, there are often time, uh, you know, significant side effect here, right? So, so that, you know, some of the policy, um, for example, will lead to significant uh, death rate, for example, right? And then, and then and, and that's a, the very serious consequences here. Then, then sometimes you actually need to use seemingly contradictory policy to offset that side effect here, right? So in terms of striking the overall balance here. So if you look at the overall balance, if it's an economic survival, if it's protection your uh, public health system and also protecting the health and life of people. These are three very important uh, goal government have to balance, right? Uh, so, so, so in, in balancing that, if you look at the choice, yeah. So, so, so if you look at the, uh, the, 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 in order to balancing these things, sometimes that you actually have to adopt a certain policy that seemingly contradictory to each other, but in fact, is actually try to do a better job in terms of balancing uh, these uh, three different objectives here. So, so if you look at you know, Singapore's current approach here, uh, it's not really uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, uh, just adopt a so-called live with uh, uh, COVID kind of strategy as you've seen in Europe and other places here where you've seen significant loss of life and uh, and also uh, you know the people's health has been kind of endangered right so 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 those are aspects that singapore is not ready to accept here so that's why actually uh, they come up with something i would call the hybrid the hybrid kind of system where they still continue to really try to open up the the country but at the same time try to do utmost to really protect the health system as well as the health of people. Yeah, that's one. Anything well, I just add? like to uh, uh, just add one short point, a uh, comment on your earlier question in relation to international collaboration. Uh, that has been uh, very disappointing, and uh, especially when it comes to the area of vaccine distribution. Uh, most of the majority uh, percentage of the vaccine is now actually being delivered and given to people in the sort of uh, rich country, uh, good economy, and uh, people in the developing countries, or even especially in Africa, uh, largely uh, they do not have accessibility to vaccine. And that mm. actually will pose the greatest sort of 